but to cultivate blessings and not wisdom is to be like an elephant wearing a necklace and to cultivate wisdom and not blessings is to be an heart with an empty begging bowl the necklace is handsome and very valuable but is all the elephant has it doesn't have any thought power any wisdom if you seek wisdom in your cultivation by studying the sutras and sitting in meditation but fail to plant any blessings and are unable to practice giving then you'll end up smart but hungry to plant blessings means one should do meritorious and virtuous deeds especially on the buddhist holidays the birthdays and anniversaries of the buddhas and bodhisattvas or on your own birthday or on the first and the 15th of the lunar month if you practice giving and create merit before the triple jewel then you will amass blessings if you do not do meritorious and virtuous deeds then you won't have any blessings if you concentrate on wisdom and don't develop blessings then no one will make offerings to you when you become an ahat. That's because on the course ground, you did not make offerings in your turn. So if you want people to make offerings to you when the time comes, you should make offerings to them now. It's as simple as the principle of planting melons, you get melons. Planting beans, you get beans. Pure vows means that before the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, you say, I vow to be born in the Western Pure Land with the nine grades of lotuses as my parents. When the flower opens, I will see the Buddha and awaken to non-production. Non-retreating Bodhisattvas will be my companions. Or you may wish to be reborn in Eastern Land. Any such vow is a pure one. Their hearts will spontaneously open, means they will awaken and they will see the Buddhas of the Ten Directions and all their pure lands and they will be reborn in whichever one they wish. If a person has blessings, wisdom and vows, then at the end of his or her life, he or she will see the Buddhas of the Ten Directions and be able to be reborn in whichever pure land he or she wants. Sutra. When they have more thought than emotion, they are not quite as ethereal, and so they become flying immortals, great mighty ghost kings, space-traveling yakshas or earth-traveling rakshas, who run to form heavens, going where they please without obstruction. Commentary. When they have more thought than emotion, they are not quite as ethereal. Emotion can be defined as a sentence. It is said that those with sentence and those lacking sentence have the same potential for knowledge of all modes. Sentence, in turn, is defined as having thought and feeling. Insentient objects include grasses, trees, and so forth. It is said, people are not grass and trees. Who among them doesn't have emotion? That's just a way of rationalizing. Everybody's got emotion. True, everyone does. And when is it evident? In youth. That's why the character emotion, Ching, is made up of the word for mind, sin, and the character for youth, Ching. When we get right down to it, we're talking here about emotional love. Basically, the word for emotion is not limited to that meaning, but that's the use of it here. Young men and women talk all the time about love and emotion. Why? Because they don't really know about it. They never finish talking about love and emotion. Day in and day out, month after month, year after year, that's the entire topic of conversation. Young people become totally engrossed in emotion. It confuses them. It's said, weighed down by karma and confused by emotion. One is a common person. Confusion is a kind of attachment, the inability to let go. Where does emotion come from? From your mind. Where does the mind come from? From your nature. That's why he said, the nature flows out and becomes emotion. 
the emotion flows out into desire. The out means down. As when the superior person aims a lofty, the petty person aims a base. When a person goes down, 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 and reaches the level of desire, then the fire of desire consumes the body. One totally loses control. It happens to both men and women. They lose self-control. Thought is persistent thought. This character also contains the character for mind. It too comes from the mind. At first, the mind has not moved, but we thought something appears in the mind. So the character for thought, xiang, is the character for appearance, xiang, over the character for mind, xin. Whatever you think about appears. This character is quite descriptive. For instance, you think about drinking and an image of wine appears in your mind. If you are thinking about eating meat, a piece of meat appears in your mind. It's the same for anything you think about, from the affairs of state to your own private matters. The sutras talk about there being no appearance of self, no appearance of others, no appearance of pupil, and no appearance of a lifespan. But we thought there are appearances. Is thought right then or wrong? Basically, E2 is not right. But since the people are attached to appearances, they end up with thought. When the thought is more than emotion, they're not quite as ethereal. This can be explained in two ways. It can mean that they don't get far. Their flight is limited, but to hold strictly to that interpretation doesn't exactly fit the context here. A better way to explain it is that their flight is not very much less extensive than the kind of flight described in the previous section, not quite as ethereal, then would mean that they can go quite far. How far? They become flying immortals. They are such that in the morning they can run a hundred thousand miles and in the evening go to nine thousand altars. Or they become greatly mighty ghost kings or space traveling yakshas or earth traveling yakshasas. These kinds of beings have already been described. They can roam for the form heavens, going where they please without obstruction. Nothing hinders their travel, nothing stops them. Sutra among them may be some with good vows and good hearts to protect and uphold my dharma. Perhaps they protect her pure precepts by following and supporting those who hold precepts. Perhaps they protect spiritual mantras by following and supporting those who hold mantras. Perhaps they protect Chan Samadhi by guarding and comforting those who are patient with dharmas. These beings are close at hand beneath the first common seat. Commentary among them, among the great mighty ghost kings, space traveling yakshas, and other such beings, maybe some with good vows and good hearts to protect and uphold my dharma. By my dharma, Shakyamuni Buddha is referring to the Buddha dharma. Perhaps they protect the pure precepts by following and supporting those who hold precepts. Maybe they make the wholesome vows to God and uphold the precepts spoken by the Buddhas. Then they will also follow and guard people who uphold, who hold the precepts. They make sure that everything for these people who uphold the precepts is auspicious and in accord with their wishes. No difficulties or troubles will arise for them. Perhaps they protect spiritual mantras by following and supporting those who hold mantras. Maybe they protect the Suragama mantra, the Great Compassion mantra, or any of the other various mantras. This is a kind of resolve they have. They follow along after the people who uphold mantras and protect them day and night. Perhaps they protect Chan Samadhi by guarding and comforting those who are patient with dramas. Maybe some of these beings make the good vow that in the future they will protect people who investigate Chan and sit in meditation so that they obtain Chan Samadhi. They help them obtain patience with dramas so that they can endure any drama whatever. 
These beings are close at hand beneath the first common seat. These beings who have made good vows and are Dharma protectors are always be, uh, always able to be beneath the first common seat and to hear the Dharma spoken. The Seven Destinies, Volume 7, Chapter 4 Sutra when their thought and emotion are of equal proportions, they cannot fly and they do not fall, but are born in the human realm. If their thought is bright, their wits are keen. If their emotion is dark, their wits are dull. Commentary. With 90% thought and 10% emotion, one gains a higher rebirth. With 90% emotion and 10% thought, it is certain that one will fall into the house. Now, when their thought and emotion are of equal proportions, they cannot fly and they do not fall, but are born in the human realm. With 50% thought and 50% emotion, there is a balance. They can't fly to the heavens to be a god or an immortal, and they can't fall into the house become, to become a hungry ghost. Where do they end up right where you and I are now? To be born in the human realm does not mean one will remain forever in the human realm. The human realm is nothing more than a transit stop, a place to transfer then to the next place. From the human realm, what will one transfer to, you wonder? Well, in order to get to the human realm, you had to have 50% thought and 50% emotion. All you have to do is take a look and see if you got more emotion now or more thought. If you've got more emotion, your next transfer will be to the house. If you've got more thought, your next transfer will be to the heavens. If you are devoid of emotion, you can transfer to the Buddha's fruition, for then you are pure young without any yin. If you have 10% emotion, you have yin. If you don't have any emotion, you are pure young and can become a Buddha. If their thought is bright, their wits are keen. If their emotion is dark, their wits are dull. This is the point of transfer. The more you think, the smarter you get and the more you understand. You attain wisdom if you cultivate and make progress by day by day. In this way, your light grows a little more day by day. It keeps increasing until it is the same as the light of the Buddhas. That's what's meant by, if their thoughts are bright, their wits are keen. Emotion is said to be yin because it is a private matter. Thought is very open and out front, very public and bright. To cultivate investigation, sit in meditation, study the Buddha Dharma and listen to the sutras are proper activities. From them you will gain keen intelligence. But love and emotion can't be discussed in a crowd. Rather, a man and woman must go to the park or the seashore or beneath a tree alone to speak in whispers. They must slowly talk things over in secret. This is what is meant by emotion being dark. Things which others cannot see are dark. The darker they get, the less light there is for them to see by and their wits are dull. They go into the forest where they can't see the sky, or they get into cars or on boats. They go to places where there are few people is to be dark. This belongs to yin and causes people to be stupid and dull-witted. They chat and chat and become stupid and stupider until eventually they fall into a bottomless pit. That's why emotion makes you fall. You talk together until you both sleep sleep and fall into the sea of suffering. Then it won't be easy to get out. You'll have to make a tremendous effort unless you're lucky enough to have a good and wise advisor who grabs you by the hands and shouts, Get out! Getting out will be very difficult. So try when they have more emotion than thought, they enter the animal realm. With a heavier emotion, they become fur-bearing beasts. With a lighter emotion, they become winged creatures. Commentary 
When they have more emotion than thought, they enter the animal realm. With heavier emotion, they become fur-bearing beasts. People with heavy emotion end up getting born as cows, horse, sheep, and the like. Do you see how dangerous it is? You'd better be careful. That's why I say the Suragama Sutra is so important. This section shows exactly the point at which people and animals cross paths. One wrong step, you end up an animal. If you're off by just a little, then it gets you. With lighter emotion, you become winged creatures. This refers to a slight variation in the degree of emotion on the part of these animals. The, the creatures that fly still have a bit of thought about them. Did you ever wonder why birds are so colorful? It's because they were human beings. They liked to wear colorful clothes. They would get all dressed up and then constantly admire themselves. The combination of excessive attention to clothing and a lot of emotion with a little thought caused them to fall into the realm of birds. Some birds are really exquisite. They must have been people who dressed especially well. Because of their emotion, they end up as animals, but the degree of their emotion is likely less than that of beasts, and so they become birds. Sutra, when they have a 70% emotion and 30% thought, they fall beneath the wheel of water into the regions of fire. When they come into contact with steam, which is itself like a terrible blaze, in the bodies of hungry ghosts, they are constantly burned by that fire. Even water harms them and they have nothing to eat or drink for hundreds of thousands of compass. Commentary with 60% emotion and 40% thought, one falls into the animal realm. With 60% thought and 40% emotion, one can gain a higher rebirth. Now, when they have 70% emotion and 30% thought, they fall beneath the wheel of water into the region of fire. When they come into contact with steam, which is itself like a terrible blaze, beneath the water cycle is fire. Volcanoes are a common example which proves that fire resides beneath the water level. In the bodies of hungry ghosts, they are constantly burned by that fire. At that time, they take on the bodies of hungry ghosts and it would be too late for them if they decide They'd rather be birds or beasts. There are a myriad kinds of hungry ghosts. The worst kind there is to be is the one whose throat is as thin as a needle and whose stomach is as big as a drum. Even water harms them and they have nothing to eat or drink for hundreds of thousands of compass. They don't even have a drop of water to drink. Why not? Because their karma is such that when they see water, it turns to a raging fire. God see water as crystal. Fish, shrimp, oysters, and things of the sea look upon water as their palace, their home. They live in it and therefore don't see it. In the same way that people live in air and but aren't aware of it. But we people didn't have air. If we people didn't have air, we would die. He said that people must eat to live, but they also must have air to breathe. But do we see air? No. Fish see water as their home, and people see water as water, but ghosts see water as fire. Why don't we see it as fire? If you want to know the difference, you can try being a ghost and find out. If you protest that you'd like to know, you'd like to know without having to be a ghost, all right, I can tell you. It's because of karmic obstacles. It's the result of the karma that they themselves created. If you make the karma that sends you into the body of a hungry ghost, then you will perceive water as fire. If you still don't believe it, you can try it out. But if you do, and really turn into a hungry ghost, it will be very difficult to get to be a person again. It won't be easy to return. So now I'm telling you, and the best would be to believe me because I'm really not treating you. Then you don't have to go try it out for yourself. 
As a hungry ghost, one is burned to death, but after a while, one revives and then has to go through being burned to death again. In that way, one undergoes birth after birth and death after death as a ghost. Because they see water as fire, the ghosts have nothing to drink and they can't eat either. How long does this go on? It goes on for hundreds of thousands of compass. Sutra. When they have 90% emotion and 10% of thought, they fall through the wheel of fire until their bodies enter wind and fire. In a region where the two interact with lighter emotion, they are born in the intermittent hell. With heavier emotion, they are born in the relentless hell. Commentary. When they have 90% emotion and 10% thought, they fall through the wheel of fire until their bodies enter wind and fire. In the region where the two interact, in this place, there's not only fire but a wind that whips up the fire so that it burns even more fiercely. With lighter emotion, they are born in the intermittent hell. With heavier emotion, they are born in the relentless hell. Sutra, when they are possessed entirely of emotion, they sink into the Avishri hell. If the emotion has gone into their hearts so that they slander the great vehicle, defend the Buddha's pure precepts, speak crazy and false dharma, are greedy for offerings from the faithful, recklessly accept the respect of others, commit the five rebellious acts and the ten major offenses, then they are further reborn in Avashi house throughout the ten directions. Commentary, when they are possessed entirely of emotion, when they have no thought, only emotion, they sink into the Avashi hell. If the emotion has gone into their hearts, if their minds are totally governed by emotion, so that they slander the great Rehigo, they make judgments about things with their emotions, and as a result, they take right to be wrong and wrong to be right. They take back black to be white and white to be black. They are totally unreasonable. They always oppose what others say. If you say, don't do things that are not good, they come back with, what's there to be afraid of? Their motto is eat meat, drink wine, and pass the time. The Buddha is only a figment of the imagination. They argue that your mind is the Buddha and the Buddha is your mind. That's the kind of devon knowledge and devon views they have. Their views become so devon that they defend the Buddha's pure precepts. Don't take the precepts, they say. What do you want to do that for? You end up with a bunch of precepts controlling you. If you don't take the precepts, see how free you'll be. In fact, if one does not take the precepts, it is very, very easy to end up in the house. Do you call that freedom? But if you receive the precepts and then use them as a guide to govern yourself, if you receive the precepts and then govern yourself by the appearance, the drama and the substance of the precepts is not so likely that you fall into the house. Even if you do fall into, into the house, you get out much more quickly. But if you advocate not taking the precepts in order to be free, then when you fall into the house, there's no guarantee when you'll get out again. If you take the precepts, then a long term in the house gets cut to a short term. It's as if you were a president's aide and broke some major law and were caught. Just a note from the president would suffice to effect your release. Without that help, it might be a long time before you are released. If you have the precepts for protection, then the suffering you have to endure for having committed major offenses will be lessened significantly. So don't outsmart yourself by deciding not to take the precepts. It's better to take the precepts. A living being who receives the Buddha's precepts enters into the position of a Buddha. Don't slander the Buddha's precepts. And don't speak crazy and false dharma. Don't deny cause and effect. Don't say things like, there's no cause and no effect. People are just Buddhas after all. There's no need to cultivate, eat meat, drink and be merry. Because no matter what you do, you still can become a Buddha. It's really easy to become a Buddha. 
Right, it is easy to become a Buddha, but the way to do it is to get rid of your phones. There aren't any Buddhas who have phones. They are all pure and they are all pure and undefined. They didn't become Buddhas by being filthy and full of karmic offenses. They didn't become Buddhas by drinking wine and eating meat. If that's the way it was, then the Buddha would not have had to speak the precepts. Don't be greedy for offerings for the faithful. Don't scheme to get people to believe in you, to give you gifts, to make offerings to you. Don't think about how you'd have more money if you took more disciples. I never discuss money with my disciples. Usually when people take disciples, it's made clear from the start that they should give at least 50 or 60 dollars to just take refuge, but I don't pay attention to that kind of thing. These kinds of beings also recklessly accept the respect of others, or they commit the five rebellious acts, which are killing one's father, killing one's mother, killing on a heart, shedding the Buddha's blood, and breaking up the harmony of the Sangha. Or they commit the ten major offenses, that is, they violate the ten major Bodhisattva precepts. Having committed these grave offenses, then they are further reborn in Avashi house throughout the ten directions. After they have undergone suffering in the, the Avashi hell of this world, they go to Avashi house in every world in the ten directions. Can you imagine how long a time that would take? When this hell is finished, they are transported to another Avishri hell. When that Avishri hell is destroyed, they move on to the next Avishri hell, is endless. And so, Devadatta, the one who tried to compete with the Buddha, fell into the hells of life, is still suffering in the hells. From the time of Shakyamuni Buddha until now, he's been undergoing hellish suffering, but in fact, that's just the blink of an eye. Sutra, although one receives one's due according to the evil karma one has created, a group can undergo an identical lot and there are definite places where it occurs. Commentary, although one receives one's due according to the evil karma one has created by slandering the great Vihago Dharma masters, by defaming the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha, by committing the five rebellious acts and the ten major offenses, a group can undergo an identical lot and there are definite places where it occurs. Although they fall into the house because of what they themselves have done, they create the karma of undergo the retribution, still a group can undergo similar retribution and it can happen in a fixed and certain place. There are definite places where they create a karma and their definite places where they undergo the retribution.